vor Ort. Ja, also ich hoffe auch ganz stark. Ja, das ist schon ein gutes, eine gute Überleitung zu der Begrüßung. And I'll switch into English at this point uh, to not scare away our English speaking participants who might uh, think uh, they found themselves in a German speaking webinar. That is not the case. You are completely correct in this place. Welcome everybody. And I'd like to um, say hello from my side. My name is Matthias Böning. I'm with uh, Pyron Global Development, an external consultancy that is um, supporting DEG in the coordination of the German Desk Financial Support and Solutions uh, project globally. And I'd uh, like to welcome you today to our third roundtable of the German Desk Financial Support and Solutions Nigeria. And as it has already been said in uh, in the opening now, this uh, usually and traditionally was a nice uh, physical face-to-face -face event uh, in Nigeria, but uh, we all know the challenging times that we're living in at the moment. So everything is digitalized. So um, I still hope you have a nice and decent John Desk experience uh, today as we try to continue the good tradition of the roundtables. And we're looking forward to a great program for the next um, one, uh, one and a half um, maybe um, two hours and um, we will have uh, three parts in this round table first a set of uh, welcome notes secondly um, in part two an overview of the economic situation in the region and also um, some remarks to financial support and solutions in the context and against the background of this economic situation and finally, we will have two business case studies um, talking to the topic of using the German desk and also using an instrument called Africa Connect. If you don't know what Africa Connect uh, is so far, uh, stay with us uh, all the way until the end. Um, and that's going to be an extra piece of information then. So I'd like to welcome again um, all participants who are still joining. Thanks uh, for being with us today for the third roundtable of the German Desk Financial Support and Solutions Nigeria. And we want to begin our program in a second. Let me just um, point you to the possibility of directly asking your questions. So you should be able to either see directly or open a chat box to the right of your screens. If it's not there, um, you might want to move your, um, your mouse a little bit and see whether you can open a chat box. And that is the nice thing about digital events that you can actually type in your questions directly. And uh, we've uh, briefed our uh, speakers in advance that there might be a question that uh, is directly um, Asked to them, and uh, the speakers will kindly also have a look at the uh, the chat box from time to time and see whether there are any questions. So please feel free to use this chat box. We also, towards the end of the program, do have a question and answer session. So your questions will not be lost if they are not answered directly, but we will then plug them in at the end in the question and answer session. So as we are still having participants who are joining. I want to welcome you again to the third roundtable of the German Desk Financial Support and Solutions Nigeria. And now we want to begin with the first part of our agenda. And it's an, it's an honor and privilege to have with us today Dr. Stefan Traumann, the German General to Nigeria. And uh, Your Excellency, thanks for being with us. And I hand over to you for your welcoming remarks. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Böning, and uh, good afternoon uh, to everybody. Um, liebe Frau Beck, uh, Managing Director of the DEG Deutsche Investitions- und Entwicklungsgesellschaft. Uh, dear uh, Mr. Bonner, Deputy Managing Director of the Access Bank Group. Um, liebe Frau Felgenhauer, Delegate of the German Industry and Commerce in Nigeria. Uh, liebe Herr Barroso da von SECA, 
head of the German desk at the Access Bank. Uh, dear speakers, panelists, and participants, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, a privilege and an honor to, to be here this afternoon, even online, with you again to the third roundtable of the German desk. Um, many of you have already participated, as I did, in last year's event at the Burr Towers on Echo Atlantic, um, followed by the big opening ceremony of the DEG West Africa Regional Office on the premises of the German Consulate in Lakes. And many of you will remember uh, the mood was festive and our speeches and discussions full of optimism. It uh, took place only 12 months ago, but today it feels like ages. The coronavirus has hit both our countries very hard. People are suffering and even dying. The public health sectors, especially in the European countries, uh, are stretched to their limits. As the second wave, particularly in Europe, shows right now, the pandemic is far from over. Uh, since yesterday, as you know, there's hope that the vaccine will be available in the coming months, but it will take time, as we all know. Our economies were hit hard and many businesses suffered. The GDP continues to shrink and the unemployment continues to rise. That means all of us new challenges ahead, in addition to the already existing ones, like functioning infrastructure, compliance, access to forums, or a reliable legal framework, to name but a few. But as a diplomat, I remain optimistic by profession. At the eighth German Nigerian Business Forum, which took place over the last two days and just uh, ended a couple of hours ago, indicated once again why. There are still good opportunities for companies in Germany and Nigeria to grow and to do business together. As we all know, it's not going to be easy. Uh, but it can be, as many examples show, very successful. And as the CEO of the Tony Ilewele Foundation, Mrs. Ugo Shoko, yesterday at the business forum stated, you have to know your business environment and you need reliable partners. And if, for instance, a German company is looking for new opportunities in Nigeria, I would highly recommend to get in contact not only with the delegation of German industry, but with the German desk as Axis Bank as well. That's because the German desk as a joint project of Axis Bank and DEG has grown over the few years of its existence already into an important pillar of our bilateral relation. Support for individual companies, background information on market conditions, but also events like this one today would offer a tremendous benefit for companies looking for business opportunities in Nigeria as well as in Germany. And I'm convinced we will have this afternoon a very interesting roundtable again. But of course, I'm looking forward to have the next meeting next year in the old fashioned way. Thank you very much and stay healthy. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for your nice words and the expressed hope for a normal event, uh, whatever that is, uh, next year again. Um, let's make this event a special event in the positive uh, sense, and I'm delighted to be able to hand over to Roosevelt Ogbonna, Deputy Managing Director of Access Bank Group, Thank you so much, Roosevelt, for being with us today. Over to you. Thank you very much, Matthias. Um, and thank you very much, Excellency, for the opening remarks. I will stand on existing protocols. You know, I'm a banker. I'm used to counting money. Protocols are not the best. Uh, we're not the best at, at, at protocols. But I'll stand on the existing protocols. And good afternoon or good evening to everyone, depending on where in the world uh, you are. I think it's instructive that 12 months after we're having the third 
uh, round table and coronavirus happens to be at the center of every conversation. I don't care which part of the world you are and, and what you do. In some sense, as it is sad, but I think even embedded in that is some reality uh, that we must all appreciate. And that's one of a collective humanity. There's no society or country that is delinked or so uh, set aside from the rest that what happens in one part of the world doesn't affect them. Uh, we'll hear that this started in Wuhan in China, but every country in the world today is having to deal uh, with coronavirus. So I think where we look for solutions for problems and the world comes together uh, to look for those solutions, it might solve one country's problem, but I think ultimately the, the world entirely benefits uh, from it. COVID has had a devastating impact globally. Um, we've seen the kind of numbers that uh, uh, the, UN, the uh, IMF has suggested that the world uh, will go through and the pressure that the world will go through in the next uh, six to 12 months. Uh, there's a, a reality today that what started as a health crisis has morphed into a, an economic crisis uh, in some parts of the world, including ours, is now a humanitarian crisis. And I think if you extend that and look at what, what happened in Nigeria in the last 30 days, is devolved into a security crisis. Uh, so these issues are real, and as financial institutions and as economic entities, uh, we need to make a difference, not just in the core business that we do, but to ensure that the business we do has an impact in, in the market that, that we deal in. Uh, I think in the last 12, 12 years, Nigeria has gone through three critical shocks. So there was the global credit crisis of 2007 to 2009. The lag effect brought it into our market in 2009, 2010. Uh, we saw the oil crisis of 2015, fourth quarter of 2014, all the way to 2016, and now this. Uh, so growing up, we read in economics that there are 10-year economic cycles. And what that did was that it gave economic units enough time to absorb the impact of one crisis uh, build on it and be able to withstand the next crisis because they build buffers that support them. Now, in 12 years, three crises, three significant crises suggest that we're seeing economic cycles shortening to anywhere between three to five years. And the impact is real on small businesses, um, on, on SMEs, and on private sector enterprises that have no economic buffer, no social uh, safety nets and doing business now becomes extremely, ex extremely uh, difficult. Uh, the Q2 numbers suggest that uh, Nigeria's GDP growth rate was a negative of 6.1% in 2020. Now, th th put that in consideration that prior to Q1 of 2020, we're growing at about 2, 2.2%, which wasn't a good growth. However, it made sense because it was still positive lagging uh, population growth rate of about 3.2%, uh, but it was growth all the same. So 6.1% uh, devaluate um, negative GDP growth rate is significant in our market, seeing that we've not fully recovered uh, from uh, the crisis of the 2016 to 2017 uh, uh, period. Now, globally, I think everyone is trying to make sense of what it is they have to do. Uh, to be able to battle the issues that everyone faces. Uh, a clear trend is that for Nigeria as an oil economy and most African countries, we're seeing commodity prices trend uh, southwards. It doesn't help. Uh, we know that shutting the borders, uh, lockdowns are good from a health perspective, but for markets like ours that depend principally on oil and economic activity actually running and planes up in the air and flying, uh, there's a lot of pressure on the economy. And it's not, on, sadly, we're not going to see a V-shaped recovery uh, or a crawling U or whatever. It will take time. And I think projections suggest that the flight to safety uh, is, is, is playing out in the gold prices. We're seeing gold prices uh, trend upwards, clearly an indication that people are looking uh, for safe homes, uh, given how risky the entire uh, macroeconomic environment globally is. So Nigeria is going to face that pressure. Um, the uh, government has started what they refer to as an economic recovery plan, 
And that plan would have meant that Nigeria would have come out of uh, recession by Q1 of next year. Uh, as wrote to me, will show in his presentation uh, around the Nigerian economic indicators. We might see that extend to Q2 or Q3 of next year, just following the impact of the NSAS crisis and the riot that followed and the economic shutdown uh, that we've had to face. There's still some positives in our market. And, and I think in doing business with, with, with Germany and, and the rest of Europe, uh, 2019 was a good year. Fourth quarter of 2019 was a speak. Uh, we saw 2020 hold as well. Um, so Nigeria still imports the traditional things we do from Germany. So a lot of machinery, a lot of equipment, cars. Uh, Nigeria still exports into Germany, mostly oil and gas. Um, with Germany, I think Nigeria continues to have a negative balance of trade. With the rest of Europe, is positive. Uh, but that relationship has continued to sustain. I think in Q4 of 2018, we saw about 133 billion naira in trade between uh, on the on the import side from Germany uh, into Nigeria, and we saw exports of about 37 billion. So still not a fair balance, but at least the trade flows held consistently uh, all the way into Q2 of, of, of Q1 of 2021, of 2020 rather, and we've seen it now tapering as we went into uh, uh, Q2. But within the Nigerian economy, I think there are sectors that are still interesting. Uh, and I know that the Germans are, or German manufacturers still play in these sectors, and it's around telecommunication. Uh, Siemens is one of a very strong supplier of equipment into our market around telecommunications. Uh, the power sector still has strong opportunities for growth, and, and Siemens and several other German companies are uh, keen and interested in that. Agriculture is one area that continues to grow even in the midst of this crisis. I think you've seen agriculture stayed positive through Q1, through, uh, through Q2, and it's been projected to continue to be positive as we go into, into Q3. I think where I see greater opportunities for growth between Nigeria and Germany is around the power sector, uh, around energy, and of course, transportation. Uh, those three, and I think if you add broadband makes it four, are critical infrastructure that Nigeria requires for growth. Um, I saw numbers sometime last week that suggested that Nigeria requires about a hundred billion naira in hundred billion dollars in investment over a thirty-year period to build the infrastructure capital required for growth. And by growth, we are saying going back to the two thousand and two thousand and eight growth rates where we're seeing six, seven, eight percent growth, well as stripping population. Uh, growth rate. And this will certainly help the SMEs uh, because they are the feeder industries. They employ their significant employers of labor into our market. It will support education, it will support healthcare, security, of course, the retail business. It will create jobs, more importantly. The humanitarian crisis we're seeing today and the security crisis is only arising because the unemployment rate has trended from what was about 22% at its best to about 67% today for youth and employment. Now, you can understand how that security uh, crisis evolves where you have 67% of the youth of the country not being gainfully employed. And I think trying to drive the infrastructure uh, uh, investment, trying to use infrastructure as a catalyst for growth uh, requires partnering, not just with uh, the Germans, but across the globe for counterparties who can come and support this growth uh, uh, agenda around infrastructure, either as suppliers of infrastructure, which the German has continued to do uh, very well with Nigeria, or actually investing uh, into these businesses through equity or, or, or debt or debt finance. What is clear from our perspective is that government can't do it alone. Uh, we don't have the fiscal buffers to be able to do so. Though. So the private sector clearly must play an active role um, in the infrastructure development that we, that we need to support growth. I think in, in, amongst the significant economies in Africa today, we have the lowest tax to GDP ratio. Uh, so it tells you clearly that government, even at the best of times, cannot generate enough uh, capital to be able to invest in this infrastructure. So it will be private sector led. It will be led like banks, uh, by banks like us and other large banks within this market. It will be led by us working with our uh, development finance partners like the DEG, the IFC, the FMO, and several international partners that are very active 
in Nigeria. It will be supporting SMEs, small businesses, and private sector businesses to build capacity on the back of the infrastructure development that has happened. And that will require that we're a bit more creative in our financing solutions uh, that we bring to the table. Traditional financing solutions might not always do it uh, to support the SMEs, and that's where the likes of the DEG uh, and, and several of the European financing partners that we work with today uh, will, will bring their support and their skill and balance sheet uh, towards helping us uh, bridge that finance gap and on the back of that, grow the, um, the trade relationships that exist uh, between Nigeria and, and, and the rest of the world. I think as Access Bank, we're committed not only to the, uh, to the development uh, uh, of and the growth opportunities that we see in our market. We operate in this market. It's still our largest market. We recognize that without the macro backdrop being positive, any growth that we're pursuing is not sustainable because ultimately there will be a fracture. So it's in our interest to grow the economy, uh, to make it more sustainable, to get people back to work by supporting the SMEs and small businesses. I think beyond that, it's also in our interest to make the trade relationships more sustainable and more endearing by being that uh, gateway to the rest of the world, connecting Africa and, of course, uh, 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 Nigeria. Uh, today, we are the largest bank in our market, largest balance sheet, largest lender. A largest customer base. And I think that in itself means that uh, beyond just focusing on making money, is in our interest to invest in our economy and make sure that it continues to grow uh, and sustain. We've done well with the German desk over the last uh, two plus years. I know that we were open after Peru, and I'm not sure which other country is open today, uh, but clearly we are very competitive in the way we do business. Uh, Sebastian's uh, uh, remit is to ensure that the German desk in Nigeria, as well as Ghana, is functioning excellently and helping to bridge the trade um, uh, gap between Nigeria as well as Germany. Uh, we're more excited when we do this, not for the large corporates, but when we're doing this for SMEs and mid-tier companies and bringing the partnership between those companies uh, and their suppliers out in Germany or their customers out in Germany. We enjoy the trade delegations that we, we through the AHK as well as DEG, we embark on into Germany on an annual basis. Uh, unfortunately, COVID has not made it possible for us this year because that in itself helps to bridge cultures and helps us to understand that uh, we have common interests and working together that we can make this work. Uh, is in our interest uh, to grow the German desk and the partnership that we build beyond Nigeria and Ghana. As you well know, Access Bank today operates out of 11 African countries. By the end of the year, we'll be in 14 African countries. If we've made it work in Ghana, we've made it work in Nigeria, I think we'll be very keen to work with uh, the DEG to replicate the German desk across many other African markets that might find this relevant. Mozambique is one market that we think is interesting, as well as Botswana, where we get there in a couple of weeks uh, uh, from today. If there's anything we're doing right, if there's a testament to the fact that the German desk is working, it's interesting to know that we got a call from our partners in the, uh, in the FMO, and they want us to replicate the German desk by creating a Dutch desk. Uh, so I think before the, in the NAS, another two to three years, we might have the United Nations working out of, out of Access Bank. So we will start the Dutch desk. I think it will start sometime in Q1 of, of next year on the outside Q2. And I think the only reason the FMO would have found this interesting is that they've seen what we're doing with the German desk. They appreciate the, uh, the bridges that we're building and the connection we're creating between Germany and, and Nigeria. And I hear their politicians back home in Holland are putting them under pressure to show that they are building bridges no different from what the German desk has done. So we're excited to be partners uh, with the DEG and AHK in what the German desk is doing. Uh, I think there's so much more we can do. And, and hopefully uh, the COVID and the reality of what the co of, of what COVID brings uh, will give us the impetus to continue to make that investment and grow uh, the partnership uh, between uh, Germany and Nigeria. And I must thank um, Herr Truman for his excitement and his, uh, his commitment to uh, German-Nigeria relationship. He's only been here for a few years, but you think he's been here forever. 
And I think your impact is being felt. And a lot of people, Nigerians particularly, and Nigerian businesses feel that there's a stronger and growing partnership. Uh, your predecessor did an excellent job, but I think you have built clearly on, on, on that uh, work that you had done. And there are clearly exciting days ahead for, for both the relationship between access between uh, Nigeria, of course, and, uh, and Germany. And Access Bank is very excited to be part of that uh, initiative that you're, you're driving and pursuing. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, and I'll stop here this time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roosevelt Ogbonna of the United Nations of Access Bank. Uh, that was very inspiring. I think we will memorize that. And um, I hand over to Monika Beck, Managing Director of DED, Deutsche Investitions- und Entwicklungsgesellschaft, and uh, for her uh, remarks, uh, closing the round of uh, welcome notes. Over to you, Frau Beck. Yeah, esteemed Consul General Stefan Traumann, uh, esteemed Roosevelt, uh, distinguished guests, dear colleagues, friends of the guest, it's my pleasure now as a third speaker also to welcome you on behalf of the DG to the third round table in Nigeria. Same as Stefan Traumann, I will remember last year we have been here nearly at the same time in the Pearl Restaurant on Victoria Island. And after we moved in a perfect traffic jam to the big opening <laughs> of the German uh, regional uh, the D of DEG's regional office for West Africa in Lagos, I will remember that. Seems to be ages ago, things have changed uh, dramatically. But yeah, I'm happy to connect with you at least uh, virtually because networking and connecting is very important, in particular in difficult times as we are. My special thanks goes to you, Roosevelt, for our long-standing partnership. Thank you for the excellent cooperation on every level. I think we really share the same objectives and values, although coming from different cultures, it's a true proof of uh, very good cooperation, and I'm uh, very thankful for that. Uh, in 2020, a special and difficult year of for everybody, you named it Roosevelt, but in particular for Nigeria. Um, the Nigerian twin crisis, twin crisis started earlier this year. Uh, you mentioned the oil price crash followed by COVID and recently the NSAS uh, protest, a very challenging year. The combination of all these events has led to a number of challenges. Um, Nigeria is in the middle of a um, historic recession, although you have already passed several crises, but I think this is also really a, a tough one. Uh, ratings are going down, international ratings going down. Um, you have a budget deficit, you mentioned it, at federal level that cannot be covered by public sector. You need private sector, you need support from, from international agencies. Um, private sector continues operating under an extreme risk of um, FX and instability. Um, you have interrupted supply chains and yeah, at least at an interim lack of confidence from international investors due to the, to the latest e events. Um, by the way, also there, your commitment, uh, Roosevelt, shown through Access Bank to help to overcome the damages resulting from the process are also remarkable. The All for One Recovery Program initiative has set a sign of solidarity, uh, helping Nigeria's people and business community to weather also that storm. Thank you, thank you for that. Times are challenging, but we at DEG have a strong belief in, in the strength and resilience of Nigerian people, as proven in many crises, as you mentioned, um, Roosevelt. As all development banks, also DEG's balance sheet, has been quite affected by the historic worldwide recession. Despite that, so we will also prob very probably be loss-making this year, um, which, um, yeah, 
is uh, seldom so, but um, in the nature of this century crisis, we can't avoid it. However, we stand to our commitments with our partners in, in Africa. We continue to look at investments and have not turned our back uh, our clients. We continue to offer financing, be it equity or debt, but also technical assistance. And we have also collected monies from the German from special programs like Africa Connect and Africa Grow. We will later report on, on these activities as well. The DG office in Lagos has maintained its business even during Corona times. And the office director, Bernard Thielemann, is uh, scheduled to return to the Lagos office very soon. I mentioned last year that our portfolio in Africa has always been very robust. The non-performing loans in Africa are significantly lower than our non-performing loans in Latin America and Asia. And in particular in Nigeria, even now with all the crises, our portfolio is performing well with hardly any losses. This speaks for the top quality of our partners here and also the attitude of Nigerian businessmen. Finally, the performance of our German desk has been remarkable. Thanks again to Access Bank for managing this ex in an excellent way. And yeah, Sebastian Barroso, well equipped, equipped, could run the office very well, even as he is now in, in Germany and not Nigeria, but I'm also sure he <laughs> we will come back quickly. But um, he has well adapted. Thanks to the excellent technical possibilities, he has adapted very well to the new environment. For example, he has participated in a dozen of virtual conferences and is maintaining close contact to existing and potential clients. I wish Access Bank and our German desk manager, as well as a further important cooperation partner, the German Chamber of Industry and Commerce in Lagos, all the best for a smooth business environment in the near future. Finally, I wish all of you, and that's the most important, all the best for your health and happiness. Check, take care, stay well, and remain, remain business focused as you always have been. That I liked a lot about Nigerian people. They always talk about business. Yeah, keep focused. Uh, thanks a lot. And I um, hope we will see each other soon. Latest next year at the hopefully then fourth German desk meeting in Lagos. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Monica Beck, Managing Director of PEG, Deutsche Investitions und Entwicklungsgesellschaft, the third partner to the German Desk Financial Support and Solutions Nigeria, besides Access Bank and the AHK delegation of German Industry and Commerce in Nigeria. And this closes our first part of uh, this uh, meeting this afternoon, the welcoming notes. And we directly want to proceed um, to the second part, which is titled Economic Situation in the Region and also uh, Financial Support and Solutions Instruments that speak to these challenges. Um, we have already talked about the economic challenges uh, that are currently um, at hand in uh, Nigeria, and we want to um, do a deep dive uh, now with somebody well equipped uh, to speak to this topic. So I'd like to hand over to Rotimi Peters, head of the Economic Intelligence Unit as, at Access Bank Nigeria, and we're looking forward to gaining some more knowledge on the economic update, Nigeria and also West Africa in times of Corona. Over to you. Um, all right, um, Mataya, thank you so much for the invitation to this um, roundtable. I think at the timely um, event, um, given what we've seen from the global environment and also what we see happening in um, Nigeria. Now, my name is, like you rightly said, and I've been taking through a brief overview of um, 
for us transparent so far, especially in Nigeria, and then what our take is as we move into um, next year. Um, from a global space, um, of course, um, we've got to talk about development in the global space. I'll just quickly just summarize. Yes, um, we've seen impact of COVID across the world and um, across key markets in the world. And the world is, um, the, the world economy remains weakened by COVID-19 pandemic. Um, our take is that the growth will probably come at around 4.2, 4.4 in 2020. For in 2021, we expect recovery probably um, within a range of 5 to 5.2%. Um, of course, across the key markets in Africa too, key markets in the world economy, um, we expect in the light of the US to recover in 2021, 4.5%. The UK will probably do 6.3, um, China's 8.2, and then India 6%. So I think, um, like has been rightly said by everyone, then 2020 is more of a lost year. And um, by 2021, we expect to see um, most of the economies then recover from the pounds of the pandemic that will so impact them in um, 2020. Um, coming down to um, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, I think um, Sub-Saharan Africa has been of course, quite um, hit by COVID. Um, growth for 2020 is expected to come to around 3.2%. Um, if you benchmark that against what IMF had said in March, it's more like a double contraction for SSE. And of course, what that means is that we expect poverty to increase this year. However, I think the silver lining in, in all this is that um, currently we are seeing that um, COVID infections have slowed down somewhat and um, the impact of the um, um, measures being put in place has meant that we are seeing a bit of um, economies in Africa begin to recover. However, the key worry for us is that um, the scope of the pandemic to spread is still there. It's still a very real threat. And as we are seeing in the likes of um, um, most of the developed clients, most of them are having a second wave now. So there's nothing stopping that happening in Africa too. We only hope that um, it's contained and then we're able to um, manage it. Um, with respect to how uh, governments in Africa have tried to manage it, they've acted quite um, swiftly. But I, I think the key constraint for most African governments is that um, most of them are constrained by funding reviews and um, very limited in fiscal space. Without a doubt, Africa's resilience is being tested. And I think it's not the first time we are seeing this. Um, we've had issues with um, the Ebola virus. Um, of course, several countries in Africa, including Nigeria, were impacted in. But we came out quite well. I would also believe that um, the impact of COVID uh, on Africa will be no different. It will come, and I believe that um, Africa will come through it. But I think uh, what will be also more important is the efforts that um, the support that um, African economies re um, receive from the international community. Um, I think um, areas in terms of healthcare support. Um, um, boosting the local containment effort to be very critical. And I think this will also help to accelerate um, growth across um, most African countries in um, um, going into 2021. If we look at the impact in terms of um, how governments have responded from an economic standpoint, I think um, African governments have been quite swift and aggressive in their actions. We've seen a mix of um, um, policies in terms of um, Reduction in interest rates, we've seen um, injection of liquidity, greater exchange rate flexibility in some African economies. We've seen temporary relaxation of um, regulatory and prudential norms. Also, we've seen um, a lot of um, intervention efforts by governments across Africa, and this, we believe, has yielded quite a number of fruits. On the fiscal side, however, and I think, like I said before, the actions have been more constrained because of um, falling revenues and also our debt situation, the debt levels in Africa and most African economies is quite elevated. And then this has kind of limited the ability of most governments to increase spending. If you look at it on the average, in terms of um, announced COVID related fiscal packages in Africa, it's around 3% of GDP. And if we benchmark that against what we see from other emerging markets, then um, it's, quite, um, uh, it's quite small. Um, if you also look at um, what has been happening across um, what other major multilateral um, institutions or written um, agencies are saying about Africa for 2020 and 2021, the likes of um, 
features of the view that growth for 2020 will probably, probably come down to around 2.1%. And um, already FIT has downgraded uh, around um, seven of the sovereigns that is raised in Africa. Seven out of 19 sovereigns have been downgraded. For, for FIT, the key concern um, is our, um, they believe is that um, African countries are, um, we are largely impacted via uh, commercial and financial leakages. And um, they also hope to view that um, most of them, are, most African countries are commodity dependent. So this, um, of course, because of the slowdown, the um, slowdown in global demand, uh, most African countries have felt the impact of this. Same also for Moody's. Moody's also holds a pessimistic view, um, and this is based largely on the fact that the most budget deficits in Africa are rising, and um, the capacity of most governments in Africa to be able to manage these debts is um, largely constrained. Um, in terms of, um, so putting it all together, I think how Africa has fared from global development or, or the key impact channels for Africa from global development have been, um, we'll likely see increasing debt service costs. We also expect to see reduced exports for African countries. And, and of course, um, foreign direct investment and will slow. Foreign portfolio investments will also slow, which will also invariably have an impact on um, our foreign reserves um, levels. If we move to the next slide, um, where I showed um, in terms of um, growth performance in Africa for 2020 and what we'll see in 2021. Um, for 2020, across uh, most African countries, um, I think it's only North Africa that will probably um, um, will not be severely impacted. Central Africa will see a growth contraction of 4.1%, Southern Africa minus 6.6%, West Africa will contract by around 4%. Only North Africa, we expect to see North and, North and East Africa are from 4.4% and 1.2% growth, respectively. But for 2021, uh, like, we'll ex like just as we see from the global environment, also from Africa, we expect most of the regions to begin to post. And the fastest growth will probably be North Africa with a growth rate of 4.5%, East Africa at 37 Southern Africa at 22 uh, West Africa at 2%, with Central Africa coming at the rear at 0.8%. Um, 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 and uh, on my next slide, I tried to show you growth performance coming down to countries now. For 2020, um, it's been a mixed fortune for African economies. Um, the fastest growing economy in 2020 will probably be Burkina Faso at 4.7%, coming down to Benin Republic, Rwanda, with uh, Guinea at 1.4 at the bottom there. But for slowest growing economies in 2020, the worst performing will be Seychelles at 13.8, then Mauritius and um, Zimbabwe, um, coming down to Zambia at um, 6%. But from 2021, uh, most African economies will begin to uh, will begin to see positive growth numbers for most of them. The fastest growth will be Mauritius at um, 8.9, then Botswana at 8%, Gambia at 7%. Well, coming down to Ghana at 5.9%. Um, but in terms of slowest growing economies in um, 2021, unfortunately, Nigeria appears to appear in this bucket. So Nigeria will be seeing the projected growth rate of around 2.6%. Same thing with Uganda. Um, I think the worst performing economies for 2021 will probably be the Democratic um, Republic of Congo and then South Sudan at um, minus um, 1%. Our take is that for 2021, um, on the next slide, I think for Africa, we expect a growth expansion of 4.1%. We think that the most of the stimulus measures that have kicked started in 2020 will begin to see the impacts and the fruits of those stimulus actions in 2021. So our take is that growth will come to around 4.1% for Africa. The inflation will come down from around 93 to 7.6%. While the fiscal balance as percent of GDP for most African economies will continue to rise, of course, most countries will need to borrow largely to be able to um, fund or to be able to manage the impact of um, the pandemic. So that will mean that um, we we'll start to see expanded borrowing, just as we see in Africa and in Nigeria. We also see expecting to play out in several other African countries. So fiscal fiscal deficits at percent of GDP for 2021 will rise from around 6 to 7% for, um, for Africa. But, um, 
unfortunately, Nigeria was just beginning to um, recover from the impact of the pandemic, where we saw, um, so we started lifting um, uh, most of the um, um, restrictions to movement were being lifted when suddenly the NSAS and protests came to what came to fall. It started quite peacefully, but unfortunately, it was hijacked by hoodlums. And um, what what eventually led to was um, the destruction of um, private and public property. The likes of the Lagos Chamber of Commerce expects that um, the, the impact of that um, uh, that protest will give us seven seven hundred billion naira loss in um, economic value for Nigeria. There are also estimates putting it as as high as one trillion naira. So. The impact of the protest will have um, a severe impact for Nigeria. Prior to the protest, our take was that um, growth in Q3 2020 was going to come to around, um, we're looking at minus 4.2%. But because of the impact of NSARS, we now believe that the um, growth rate in um, Q3 2020 will come to around 4.6%. While for Q4, our prior position was that uh, growth was going to come to around minus 0.7%. But because of the impact of the protests, we're not, we're not projecting the negative growth rate of around the minus 4.1% um, in the first quarter, in the final quarter of 2020. For us, uh, we believe that uh, we're not likely to see a positive growth until the second quarter of um, 2021. So the impact of the protest is going to, um, we're, we're going to see that play out up until Q2 2021. From a macro update stance, I think Roosevelt has already mentioned the fact that um, the economy contracted by 6.1% in Q2. Crude oil output is down to 1.46% and 1.46 million barrels per day. Of course, Nigeria has been abiding with the OPEC um, restrictions, so that has meant that our production has declined. Oil prices have been likely pressured. Um, at, the, at the start of um, October, prices were at around 42. But then because of the impact of the second wave of COVID in Europe, we've seen a slowdown in global demand for energy. So oil prices have um, tapered down once a bit to around $39 per barrel currently. Our exchange rate is currently at around the 381 naira to a dollar. And the key question many will ask is that um, does trade in Nigeria take place at this price of 381? Um, so that is no, but I will I will delve a bit more on this um, shortly. Inflation is currently at around 13.7%. It has continued to rise because of the impact of um, the um, cost reflective increase in um, energy tariffs. Also, the end of subsidy on um, petrol in Nigeria, which has stopped as meant that inflation has picked up. Um, key interest rates, our benchmark interest rates is at 11.5%. It was 12.5 a few months ago. The central bank at its last monetary policy committee meeting um, brought down to 11.5%. Our trade balance also is it's a bit constrained, while our external reserves is at around $35.7 billion. So at $35.7 billion, it's able to finance um, around eight to nine months of imports, so which is quite um, still at commendable um, levels, I must um, I must say. I think on the next slide, um, I think um, this slide just speaks about of the Nigerian story. So what likely, what's happens to crude oil price likely determines how Nigeria will fare. And what you see in the chart is a very close correlation between crude oil price and um, our external reserves. Of course, as you know, uh, more than 70% of um, Nigeria's government revenue comes from oil. 95% of our exports is via oil. So whatever happens to oil will, will certainly have a huge impact on the performance of the economy. And like and, 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 and then like this chart shows you that there's a very strong correlation between oil price and um, our reserves. And on the next slide, we then begin to see the impact of this cross correlation. And um, prior to COVID, um, there was almost um, the naira, the official rate, which is the NAFEX rate, and the parallel rate were almost at par. And um, however, with the onset of COVID. And with the decline in oil prices, which we saw in the month of um, March to about June, we saw that the Nigeria began to lose oil revenues. And because of that, government capacity to continue to defend the currency became severely impacted. So what you see there is a widening delta between um, the official rate, which is the NAFEX rate, which you see as the green line there, and the parallel rate, which you see as the blue line. 
the deep um, color um, portion of the graph shows the spread between our official rate, which is the NAFEX, and the parallel rate. Um, currently, that spread has widened to around um, 18 naira or so to a dollar. Um, the question I'm being asked often is so, so what then is the value of the, where then is the true value of the naira? You see, at the official rate of the, the NAFEX rate of 385 naira or 386 naira to a dollar, or is it at the parallel level of um, 460, 465? That question I'm being asked all the time. And on the next slide, I tried to. My response to that um, question is that, um, well, I think the only way to find out is to see what really is the true value of the Naira. And we came up with different uh, methodologies to arrive at a Naira valuation. We have three key methodologies that we employed. There's the interest rate parity model, purchasing power parity model, and then really effective exchange rates. Depending on which one you use, or regardless of which one you use, what you clearly see is that there is a level of mispricing between where the Naira is currently, which is around 385, uh, and where it should um, correctly be. So if you use uh, uh, the interest rate parity model, Naira really should be trading at around um, 3, 8, 398 Naira to a dollar, which is a level of mispricing of around um, 12 Naira. If we're to use the purchasing power parity models, Naira should be somewhere between 3, 432 and 472 Naira to a dollar which brings about a level of mispricing of between 45 and 85 Naira to a dollar. However, if you use the really effective exchange rates, Naira should be trading somewhere between 465, which brings about a delta of around 78 Naira. So you see that regardless of what valuation methodology is employed, Naira is clearly, um, um, it's not currently being priced appropriately. And if we take an average of all these um, various techniques that we use, we see so that Naira should be trading at somewhere between 433 Naira to 440 Naira to a dollar. And then that's where we think right, really the Naira should be. Currently, Naira at um, um, 386 really is not reflective of market realities. And of course, I'm aware that the, C the, C uh, the Central Bank of Nigeria has been under a lot of pressure by the likes of the IMF and the World Bank to carry out a bit more price adjustments on the FX. Um, Will the CBN um, um, comply or um, or or yes comply with that pressure? I think um, only time will tell. But we believe that as we go into 2021, we expect to see a bit of more price correction on on the FX rates. On the next slide, then this I will see several intervention measures which have been deployed by the government in a bit to. And limit the impact of COVID. Um, we've seen monetary measures. Um, for the monetary measures, we've seen the um, existing um, measures targeted towards existing banking industry loans, such as um, granting one year moratorium on principal repayments. We've also seen um, government reduce or the CBI cut down with um, lending its intervention facilities from around nine to five percent. Also, from the fiscal side, like I said before, we've also seen the um, pump price of petrol re um, reflect more of market qualities now. So it, it, it used to trade at around 145 naira, 145 naira per liter. It's now at 160, 145 to 160 naira per liter. So clearly, we've seen a bit of intervention measures in a bid to um, mitigate the impact of COVID. But I think um, where we've seen a plethora of um, actions. Space, which I show, which I will show on the next slide. We've seen a plethora of actions taken by the CBN to try to um, limit the impact of COVID on the economy, especially through FX. So we've seen actions targeted towards non-oil export proceeds, oil export proceeds, actions targeted towards um, FX cash documents, even in account of um, of um, individuals. We've seen actions targeted at um, burrito change operators. I think the most controversial has been the destination payment on all forms for main payments. So um, in the month of um, September, the CBA came up with a policy to stop um, buying companies from accessing FX. CBA was of the view that um, buying companies were, um, their actions were leading to over invoicing of um, items, which had meant that prices of items in Nigeria were rising. So in a bid to curtail that, um, Effect CBN stopped them destination payments for uh, stopped them 
middle companies um, buying companies from accessing FX, and that has led to there's been a bit of complaint across the industry on that. However, we don't, um, our take is that CBN is looking into this again, and we'll likely see some relaxation of actions on that space. Of course, the crisis we are seeing today is not new. Um, we saw something similar in 2016, like um, Roosevelt um, alluded to. I think um, what is uh, most of the actions we saw in 2016, um, some of the actions taken then, some are also beginning to play out in 2020. So the, the, the likes of um, the restrictions on them, um, items for FX, that we saw those actions in 2016. In 2020, we've seen those actions also play out. Also, we've seen um, moral situation and public sensitization by, this, by the government play out in 2016. In 2020, that has also been some of the actual take. I think what has been new so far in 2020 has been that we've seen the CBN um, extend um, the um, contract on the it, um, OTC features contract. Um, we did this action was we did this action in 2016, but we are seeing that play out in um, 2020. So there's been a plethora of actions by the CBN in a bid to manage um, FX. Um, in terms of where we see the economy playing out for the rest of this year and 2021, like I said, um, our take is that um, without it, Nigeria is in a recession already, and we don't expect us to exit a recession, like I said, until Q2 of 2021. For the rest of 2020, we expect exchange rates. We think exchange rates will stay at around 385 to 390 at the official rates. But for 2021, our take is that we'll, we see some pressure on CBN and CBN carrying out a bit of more price adjustment on FX. So our take is that the, um, the Naira will adjust to around 415 on the average for 2021. For interest rates, we expect um, CBN continues to carry out. We expect more of an accommodative stance by the CBN. We see the interest rates coming down from around 11.5% where it is currently to around 10%. Inflation, we expect to see more upward pressure on inflation. Um, I think this will stem from the past three effect of the currency weakness. Also, the, uh, the impact of the increase in tariffs in um, energy will continue to impact inflation numbers next year. Oil prices, I think depending on the demand and supply dynamics, we think that um, oil prices will remain range bound somewhere between 40 and $45 per barrel. But we think it will average around $42 per barrel for 2021. While for growth, we, uh, we think that growth will come in at around 2.5% in 2021. Like I said, um, we're not likely to see a recovery until the second quarter of 2021. However, we think on, on a full year basis, um, we expect a growth expansion of around 2.5%. Um, um, we think the impact of the um, intervention measures via the economic sustainability plan, we begin to see more of this impact begin to um, permeate the system next year, and then that will help to uh, prop up growth a bit, but we, we don't expect it to exceed 2.5% on the average. Um, so that's about a certain talk for my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Otimi Pios, Head of Economic Intelligence at Access Bank Nigeria, for this very insightful overview. Against this challenging but also uh, promising background, the German desk is uh, working in Nigeria, um, although at the moment remotely from Germany. But um, Sebastian, please give us an idea of where we are at at the moment with the German desk and what lies ahead. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthias. Um, and uh, thank you very much also, Rutimi, for this very insightful um, presentation. I think um, uh, this can never be enough data, um, especially in this time. So thank you very much for, for taking your time to, to participate. But let me also uh, thank uh, and start by uh, the Excellency Dr. Stefan Traumann for uh, giving us the welcome note for Ms. Monica Beck and uh, the Roosevelt also. Many thanks for participating and uh, taking your time here. Um, I want to give you a short overview of uh, what we have achieved so far and most and for all, what we have in mind for the, for the future. And um, I want to talk a little bit about the change that we are living in. And I have prepared seven slides for that. Uh, so, um, I will start here. So distinguished guests and uh, ladies and gentlemen, 
Uh, today marks the third year anniversary of the German Desk Financial Support and Solutions. Um, as we heard, a collaboration between Access Bank PLC, DG, and the two German Chambers of Commerce uh, located in Nigeria and in Ghana. Um, I'm therefore very proud and also glad to see and to also welcome you to this third edition of the German Desk. As we heard already, um, we had a very insightful and very interesting meetup last year and two years ago also where we had a very interesting dinner at uh, Miele, one of our clients. Um, but as I was scrolling down the participant list, um, and I see BSF, I see Christian Vessels just joined, I see uh, C. Werman, a lot of uh, big customers, but also, of course also some SMEs that uh, I see here on the participant list, and I'm very happy that you all joined for this special occasion today. Um, and as many of you have been uh, part of this right from the start, some of you and most of you joined us uh, during the last years, whether it was from Nigeria, Germany, or Ghana, or let's uh, who knows in the, in the next future uh, from which country also we are going to have participants joining. Um, with more than 80 active collaborative active collaborations of operating German businesses, uh, the German Desk Financial Support and Solution has grown to a remarkable and reliable partner in the markets we serve. Um, together, together with our partners, it has always been our aim to provide you with tailor-made solutions, consult you on various dimensions of uh, doing business and in respect to financial markets across the region and of course cross borders. And not to forget, to connect you amongst our growing network and contribute our part of the social region. As we can see on the last, on the next slide, uh, the journey has been quite interesting and we have had many joint events. Uh, if I see the last year event on the round table at uh, the Pearl, the opening of the German desk in Ghana, or was it uh, uh, the, the Angesis uh, Dialyst Center in, in Ghana as well. So the journey was very interesting so far. But now, as we have looked back on our journey, so let us take a look towards the future, a path ahead that will be challenging because the unpredictability will continue to rule, but we will continue to inspire us and strengthen all of our capabilities to better understand the fast growing world in which we are living in. On the next slide, I uh, want to mention this quote by Charles Darwin, which I thought quite uh, accurate at the moment. It's, it's not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent, but the most responsive to change. And if I look personally on my everyday, it's a deluge of new information. No two days is the same. And I find myself sometimes in the cliche uh, of, of uh, that change is, is the only constant. Um, in our daily business, when we talk with you, our clients, it is clear that every corporate faces unique challenges due to the pandemic and tries to adapt uh, as fast as possible while in the best interest for their companies. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that we all choose the same path, the same way, or that we one approach is better than the other. Um, just let me give you an example of two banks. I was reading this article lately uh, where two banks in Frankfurt in Germany took different approaches in the last five months to find the best solution to adapt to the future of work. Whilst one was looking to increase their working space in order to provide more space for their employees to guarantee social distancing, the other bank was, uh, has decided to reduce the working space and uh, by, by quitting, off, uh, quitting part of their rented offices because of that most of their employees are uh, working from home. In times where we used to work in a predictable, more constant world, we were able to change and control most of the things with our own sheer will. Um, today's world is in constant change and things are moving far more quickly than they used to, which can lead to a big disconnect. Expectation and goals are, as they say, in flux, as they are arising and diminishing simultaneously, and it is imperative for us to listen carefully to what is driving you and your businesses as our clients and stay connected even more. So on the next slide, I think I've chosen this 
quite interesting picture to show you that something I have learned uh, along the years with Access Bank that Access Bank has always come out stronger after such crisis. And I quickly learned to adapt this narrative of the bank to listen first whilst anticipating the situation and come up with the innovative solution. So with this constantly shifting dynamics of the pandemic means we have to adopt to a flexible mindset uh, with regards to our products, revising timelines and adapting them to new circumstances. In order to accomplish this, we as the German desk are focusing on the following. The next slide shows that we want to enhance communication through frequent informational webinars, whether it is in the ethics, whether it is trade, whether it is agribusiness, whether it is in the sustainability. We want to, we want to, to create an economic snapshot together with our partner DG, which we already had this year, and of course other stakeholders that are also participating here in this webinar. Um, I'm looking forward to create a survey, a client survey to also understand the needs and to understand where we have to focus with our clients. And again, we want to create this time, and this is also in collaboration with our German Chamber of Commerce in, AHA, in, in, in Nigeria and hopefully also in Ghana, a quarterly newsletter highlighting case studies of different organizational responses to the pandemic. So to conclude, we hope to continue to endure and continue to add value for our customers who seek our services and for communities we, share, we serve. I would like to thank the management of Access Bank, Roosevelt. I would like to thank DG, Ms. Monika Beck, Klaus Helsper, Volker Schwab, the German Chamber of Commerce, the consulate, the embassies, and especially my team in the German desk for the great support they have given and provided me over the years. We have still a lot of things to look forward to and a lot of things to accomplish in the upcoming years. And I'm very grateful for this opportunity and very much looking forward to that. So my thanks to you. Thank you for, for taking your time today and um, looking forward to also hear from you after this. Thank you so much, Sebastian Barroso da Fonseca, the German Desk Manager of the German Desk Financial Support and Solutions Nigeria. Uh, at this moment, we don't want to be too formal because yes, it's about uh, information sharing. Yes, it's about updates, but to be quite honest, Sebastian, it's also a little bit your party um, that we're celebrating the existence of the German Desk and I think I'll, I will be joined by all speakers and participants in thanking you for your work and uh, for your commitment to um, this instrument supporting um, bilateral German-Nigerian um, trade relations, but also investment relations. At this point, I want to thank. <laughs> at, at this point, I want to hand over to Volker Schwab of DEG. Senior Investment Manager uh, responsible at the moment both for coordinating the German Desk project worldwide, but also for a new instrument called Africa Connect. And this um, sort of strengthens, but also complements the service offer that we currently have with the German Desks. So over to you, Volker, for the presentation on Africa Connect. Thank you very much, Matthias, for this excellent handover. Congratulations, Sebastian. Three year third anniversary, a, a big uh, issue. Thank you very much. Thanks to all my pre speakers. And of course, thank you very much to you, esteemed audience, for your interest and for attending in this webinar. Um, I'll take the next round about 10 minutes to introduce to you the Africa Connect program, um, which enables us to offer streamlined financing in challenging markets not only in challenging markets, but also in challenging times. So I think it's worth and uh, should be of interest to all of you to learn a bit more about Africa Connect. And therefore, let's get started. The first slide, which um, first of all visualizes the whole product portfolio of DG. Um, as uh, most of you probably know, DG, German investment development company, we offer tailored financing solutions for private sector investments. And it's our, our aim, our target to provide any kind of support along 
the complete company life cycle along the complete investment cycle. So starting at a very early at the initial phase, while you're at the growth phase up to the maturity phase, where the DG core business is most important, the, the let's say, um, commercial financing by debt, mezzanine, but also by equity structures. Um, however, if you look at the graph, and if you just imagine that the box where you see Africa connect, if you just imagine this box is missing, what, what would you note? The answer and also the solution is, is on the next slide. So um, what has been missing so far? It's a, a kind of a tailored support for EU companies entering the African market or expanding their business by investing smaller or medium sized amounts. We have solutions in the initial phase we could support by, um, by helping out to, to carry out visibility studies. And later on, if you plan a big investment, we can support you by providing commercial finance. But what if you want to start step by step and you're in the phase where you just want to invest between one, two, three or four million. So there has been the missing middle, we say. And Africa Connect is, is one solution for that. It offers attractive financing for medium sized investments, and it should be um, interesting for anybody of, who, of you who plans to invest anything, any amount between one and let's say up to 8 million euro. Um, it allows us to offer streamlined financing in challenging markets. And uh, thanks to the flexibility of the fund of this program, the German Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, the BMZ, we are not only able today to support new investments, but also to bridge liquidity shortages, which are caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. You see on the right side of this slide that uh, the structure is, uh, is uh, intended to be as lean as possible. So actually funds directly go to the, to the African lender which uh, is supported by the EU shareholder that should provide equity and Africa Connect provide, Connect provides the loan financing. So let's uh, go a bit deeper on the next slide, um, looking into the investment facility of the program, which is um, the solution for EU investments in African countries. It's applicable or eligible not only in Nigeria, but important to mention in this context, it's uh, definitely not only eligible in so-called uh, compact with Africa countries. Um, we are often approached by, by um, investors from Nigeria. Can I also apply? Yes, you can. So what in general is eligible? Um, either you are a um, subsidiary of a EU, com a EU company, that is already active in Africa and you plan to extend your business there or um, you as the European mother company plan a new greenfield investment in Africa and you want to enter the market and have financing needs for your project company. Also important to mention, but at the same time important to point out that this is and shall remain the exceptional case, but under certain circumstances we can also finance uh, African companies in case they have a long-term and strategically important business relationship with the EU company. We can also look into possibilities to provide loans to the African off-takers of German equipment, machinery, services, whatever. But as pointed out, this is the ex exceptional case and uh, we can do only in case there's a strong relationship, but it's possible. The basic requirements to apply for Africa Connect financing is that you as the sponsor, respectively the, the borrower, you have available an adequate equity portion, we say between 20 and 50 percent, depending on our risk assessment of the project. And uh, you should demonstrate that the borrower who takes the loan is able to service the loan from its operating activities. If this is the case, what condition does Africa Connect offer? I think really very attractive conditions, especially as we are in this small to mid-sized segment. 
Um, we are talking about loans in the amount of between 750,000 euro and up to 4 million. Um, euro or US dollar is standard. In some um, cases, we can also offer local currency. Unfortunately, Naira is not in our portfolio so far. We are working on it, but um, I cannot give you any, any sign or signal until when this will be possible by now. Unfortunately, tenors up to seven years with optional grace period, depending on the project needs. Just mention Euro, US dollar and selected local currency can finance up to 80% of the investment at attractive risk oriented, but believe me, attractive interest rates. And um, what is also important to mention is the risk sharing approach, which is um, meant in a way that Okay, you should provide the equity, re require equity, which is the risk portion taken by the investor. But we usually do not ask for parent guarantees, nor for local pledges, asset pledges, land pledges, share pledges. We want to keep the structure as lean as possible. Exceptions are possible as well, but that's the overall idea and intention of the program. Um, what is financed? Yeah, your assets for setting up or expanding the business, but also to a certain portion within the investment financing scheme, working capital for setting up and expanding the business. That's it for the financing um, facility. If we go to the next slide, we see that we are fully aware that maybe this is not the best and right time to consider investments. We are happy for everyone who still does who still is in the position and shape to, to really think about expanding or starting new business. However, we are fully aware that currently the situation, especially due to COVID, internationally brings along huge challenges. And um, yeah, the pandemic has just massive impact on the global economy. It affects all, almost all, or let's say all African economies, all worldwide economies, and of course, or companies operating in, in the markets. What challenges do we see? Government all of lockdowns, declining global demand, long delays in the supply chain, cross-border disruption in the logis logistic chain, which results in existential threats for the companies. Yeah, we see companies facing acute liquidity problems due to a decline in sales at continuously incurred cost. Uh, you face the challenge of uh, loss of trained and qualified workers. Uh, business relationships might get lost. Market position might get lost. And that's all just because the pandemic yeah, has, has such huge impacts. So Africa Connect, um, we discussed with, with the BMZ, as I mentioned in the beginning, back in March, April this year. And um, the BMZ very quickly confirmed that, yes, you can use the funds not only, which is the original intention to create new jobs in Africa, but also to save existing jobs in Africa. So let's switch to the next slide to see how it works or who is eligible for this um, liquidity shortage finance. Uh, in this case, it's definitely designed for subsidiaries of EU companies who are already successfully operating in Africa and uh, which have created local jobs and want to secure those during the crisis, which, and uh, this is important, which have a fundamentally sound and profitable business model with sufficient credit worthiness, which allows them to service the loan through operating activities once the crisis is over, and which face the liquidity bottleneck really just because of the COVID-19 crisis. And at the same time, we have a good outlook for the period after the crisis. So important to mention, and I think this was a big discussion in the beginning um, in Germany when, when the government um, designed or created these supportive funds with billions of euro inside. Finally, we have to make sure that the money is supplied well. And it's not the idea to help out companies who have let's say structural problems, who have had structural problems before and 
without a sound business model, it's important that we can see some kind of proof that yes, the business model has been proven, has been sound before the crisis and the problems or the challenges you are facing now are really because of the crisis. If this is the case, we can offer quite attractive financing as well. Again, between 750,000 and up to 4 million euro, uh, up to seven years with optional grace periods. Of course, for liquidity financing, we try to keep the tenor as short as possible, but in general, also up to seven years are doable. Euro, US dollar or selected currencies. And in this case, we can finance up to 100% of the liquidity gap if thereafter the company or the borrower still shows, uh, let's say, an adequate and sufficient equity ratio. We, we offer that at highly attractive conditions, considering the purpose of the loan. So we decided to charge a maximum of 2% interest. It might even be lower, but this is exclusively for this COVID-19 response liquidity gap financing. What is financed in this case, it's the working capital for the continuation of operations, uh, your operating costs, including rent, salaries, inventory, whatever you need to cover to, to come through the crisis. So next slide, please. And um, I think this is already to sum up my last slide. Um, yeah, the summary ending with a quick check. Are you eligible or not? Is your project eligible or not? Um, what is outside and inside the scope of Africa Connect? Um, I think despite you shouldn't end with a negative message, and I won't end with a negative message, I think it's also important with regard to expectation management to also point out um, what finally is not eligible to finance under Africa Connect. So as I mentioned, companies without a profitable business model and sufficient equity, that's not the target group. Um, also, companies wishing to restructure or redeem existing loans or use the funds to distribute profits and pay dividends. I think that's uh, no, no, no doubt about this here. And finally, also important to mention what we would like to see is a kind of a proof of concept. So Africa Connect is not designed for very early stage for greenfield without any any track record at all or any proof of concept. Remember the graph in the beginning. Um, in this very early stage, uh, we have some supporting measures, for example, with the feasibility studies or with develop. Africa Connect is when you enter into a growth stage, but it can still be a young growth stage, no doubt. So you are eligible if you can confirm the following aspects. If you're interested in the investment financing because you still plan to invest in, in Nigeria. Um, so if you plan expansion or market entry, if you have a strong EU link, if you have a profitable business model and you have sufficient funds for equity contribution available, you are generally eligible. And for the COVID-19, to sum up, you are eligible if you face an acute liquidity problem due to the crisis, if you have a new shareholder, if you have had and can show a profitable business model before the crisis, and if you can convince us there's a plausible going concern for the period after the crisis. If this is the case, and I hope many of you from the audience now have ticked boxes in your, in your mind, in your, in your brain, we are very happy, I'm very happy to get contacted by you. You will find my contact details on the really last slide. And uh, of course, you can also find further information in the internet and I'm available. Hopefully, we have still some time for questions and answers later on. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Volker Schwab of DEG, both responsible for the German Desk Financial Support and Solutions and also the Africa Connect program. Before we come to our third part using German Desk and Africa Connect, I just want to invite you to enjoy one of the benefits of digital conferencing and uh, we should also do good to ourselves. So if you want, uh, take the freedom at this stage to turn off your camera and stretch for a second um, because we are all spending long hours uh, in these COVID times in front of the screen. I don't know if you've uh, actually tried to calculate uh, 
the number of hours you've spent in e-meetings uh, since the first uh, lockdown or the first uh, days and weeks of uh, COVID in March. So uh, if you want, um, turn off uh, your video for a second and uh, stretch. And while you're getting back, I am introducing now our first uh, uh, speaker of uh, the third part. And the third part is titled Using the German Desk and Africa Connect, the instruments we have just um, uh, talked about and that were just uh, presented. Um, this all sounds uh, very good, um, but it only gets hands and feet uh, if we are hearing real business cases where um, these instruments also um, were employed and uh, yielded good results. So I want to um, hand over now to Hendrik Reimers, founder and CEO of Fair Afrique. And much more than that, I really like what you've put on your LinkedIn profile, where it says you're a made in Africa evangelist. So uh, very happy to have you with us, uh, Hendrik Reimers, over, over to you. Um, yeah, thanks so much. Um, uh, thanks everybody for your contributions and uh, Sebastian, um, yeah, um, happy anniversary and um, congratulations on everything that's been achieved. Um, yes, Fair Freak um, is, is, is a business that um, uh, is uh, yeah, born out of the motivation to add more value to local resources. Um, I see on this picture here cocoa beans and um, uh, the reality of the chocolate business um, in, in the world today is that these cocoa beans leave West Africa uh, for around two euros per kilogram um, when they're exported. And then when they're sold as chocolate in Europe, they are trading for uh, around 20 to 30 up to 100 euros per kilogram. And um, that in, in increase in, in, in value is, is almost uh, uh, to 100% degree um, realized in, in Europe at the uh, yeah uh, at this moment, and Fairfreak changes that. We've started producing um, chocolate in Ghana in 2016, and though with um, a, a very small um, uh, to, to to very small extent, and um, in 2019 we um, we partnered with an established um, German chocolate business um, to build a large scale a very modern solar powered chocolate production in Ghana, uh, actually in rural Ghana in the eastern region where the organic um, cocoa beans grow that we are using. And it is it has proved very quickly a very, very big challenge um, to finance such an endeavor. Um, why clearly um, this is a greenfield uh, um, investment um, uh, ramping up a small production big time, um, which in, in Africa itself, uh, finding commercial banks supporting that or private money um, is very, very difficult. Um, and finding European banks to support us in, in this has also been very difficult as they um, face difficulties or for them it's, it's actually impossible to use um, any of the machines um, or the factory itself as collateral, um, which uh, um, led us to speak to uh, DEG. So uh, literally everybody that, um, that, that dared talk to us and listen to our story at the end of the day referred us to DEG. You need to talk to DEG. And that's what we did. And um, we actually took, um, took advantage of both Africa Connect, um, which was um, introduced just now, and also um, the COVID-19 response. Um, so in, uh, in late 2019, um, DG um, uh, offered us a loan to finance, I'd say, about a third of um, the whole project, um, which then was also a vote of confidence into the project and opened a lot of doors for us. So not only um, did we did we enjoy um, meeting, um, you know, the um, uh, a lot of key political players um, in Ghana, but we also um, our our access to, to networks in, in Germany and in Europe uh, broadened quickly. And with the kind of DEG stamp of quality um, on your project, it is it is much easier to um, 
uh, to access further financing. And the remainder of the financing was, was um, equity from, from our um, uh, strategic investors. Um, we also um, gathered a lot of um, private investors' monies uh, through, um, through uh, public bond offerings in Europe. Um, and we had our, our, our bank actually uh, join the club as well, um, thanks to DEG's commitment. So without um, uh, DEG's involvement, it would have been very, very difficult to get any other European bank involved. So that has really been um, an addition, uh, additional uh, um, yeah, value add and for us a big, big benefit um, as all the, the, the other benefits that I had just mentioned. Um, in, in March, April, um, we were just entering production phase. We, uh, our, um, the, the planning and the, the whole um, uh, purchasing and, and project management uh, preparation part um, took us uh, to, into, into April. And then in April, we started um, construction just as COVID really um, struck West Africa. Um, Ghana closed its borders. Um, almost the day we 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 um, did the groundbreaking, so it was uh, it was very poor timing um, for us. There it made everything very difficult. Um, but literally days after um, we realized this is going to become um, a much more difficult than we anticipated. Um, it was actually DEG who called us and not the other way around and asked us how we're doing and um, if there's anything DEG can help with. And having having these kind of partners that are not, um, you know, covering for <laughs> covering themselves in these kind of crisis situations and, and and trying to scale their their commitment back, but actually you know reaching out and saying, um, what else can we do? Like, is there anything that you're struggling with? Um, just made it even more clear to us what a strong partnership um, this is, um, not just for the money, but also for you know really pushing this project through together. And um, eventually, um, we got another top up um, uh, of DEG, um, which also um, managed to increase the buy-in and the commitment of our other stakeholders um, and um, made it possible for us to finish construction of, of the chocolate factory within five and a half months. So we started in uh, mid-April and we finished end of September and was the first bars produced. We are now exporting the first container um, very much in time. Uh, um, and that's really only possible if you have very strong financing partners. So this clearly would have not been possible with, 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 with your kind of average um, go-to um, private uh, financing partners. A lot of interest, a lot of commitment has actually not materialized over time. Um, whereas, um, was in, in the case of the COVID nineteen response, this was something very, very. Um, uh, um, how can I say that? Um, it was certainly not very easy to access it, and um, because there there was another due diligence uh, involved. But it's something that you clearly see um, your financing partner um, not looking in a way: is this really going to materialize? But trying to make sure that it's going to materialize um, very constructive and not critical partner although um, um, looking at um, feasibility and um, you know uh, the, the business kind of case behind that and whether there is um, there is the the commercial success possible um, is also something that um, that gets our self thinking and and um, you know the, the, the way DEG has challenged us on our assumptions has really made our business case stronger and our response to other financing partners I think uh, more appropriate and yeah like um, I'm, I'm happy to to answer um, any questions in terms of our experience here um, also feel free to to reach out on, on LinkedIn. Um, you see my name here in the panel panelist um, list, and uh, um, from from the experience that Fair Africa did um, uh, dealing um, with 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 DG Africa Connect and and the whole team there has been has been really um, very good, and I can only encourage you to um, to look into this and and work with the guys um, in, uh, when you're looking for 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 sustainable long term partnership for your financing. Thank you, Hendrik Reimers, uh, a real uh, 
laureate here on cooperation uh, with uh, with DEG. Um, so uh, th <laughs> thanks a lot for that very uh, positive uh, message here. Um, we want to come to the uh, last presentation of today in that uh, third part, uh, and I want to hand over to Jasper Graf von Hardenberg, Group Chief Executive Officer of uh, Daystar Power, and we're very much happy to have you with us, Graf von Hardenberg, and over to you. Yes, uh, thank you very much, and um, it, it really is a, is a pleasure to be talking here and talk about Daystar Power and Daystar Power's experience um, with um, the German desk um, from DG and Access Bank, as well as Africa Connect, because we've been yeah, working with both for, for a bit of time now. Um, but maybe um, I would like to start with an introduction of, um, of Daystar Power, really, and, um, and what we're doing. So if we just go to the next slide. Um, Daystar Power is really a business that's all about providing reliable, clean and affordable power to businesses in West Africa, because in West Africa, particularly Nigeria, but also some of the other markets in West Africa, we really have a problem with power. And everyone of the team or the people here in this call who are in Nigeria know this um, with noisy generators, high power expenses and unreliability being a real problem. So what we do actually is we try to solve this by combining various different cleaner technologies like PV solar, like battery storage, potentially gas, um, to um, power solutions that, uh, that reduce the power cost and improve reliability. Um, because it's not only the high power cost that companies are suffering off, it's also the unreliability of power. Certain businesses are just not possible to run if the lights go off all the time, because not just lights, it's also machinery, which can be very sensitive. We serve companies um, across all segments, really, ranging from large industrials like steel plants, bottling plants, to um, also more commercial outfits. For instance, we serve a majority of the West African banking industry with our systems. Access Bank is a client of ours, for instance, but many others as well. Um, and all really with this mission to help our customers reduce their power costs and um, yeah, also drive a more sustainable future for them. Let's please go on. Yeah, so here just very quickly um, what, uh, what the picture looks like in Africa. So on the left-hand side of the slide, what you see is um, the diesel consumption in different countries, not used for cars, no, used for generating power. And you can see Nigeria really as um, the biggest consumer of diesel in Africa. And it's not only the biggest consumer of diesel in Africa, it's together with India, India the biggest consumer of diesel in the world uh, for power generation. Um, and if you look at the right-hand side, you see that the diesel expenditure in West Africa is a significant portion of power cost expenditure. Um, so if we think of power costs in West Africa, a lot of that is really for diesel. And this, this is a problem because it causes very high um, costs for businesses. And we see that on the next slide, please. So left-hand side, we see just how power costs differ across nations. And you see at the very top, we have Norway, uh, which with its big hydropower plants has very cheap electricity for its industrials and only $5 cents per kilowatt hour. And in Nigeria, if you combine, look at a typical business running diesel generators and having a bit of grid from time to time, you're looking pretty much at $25 cents per kilowatt hour. That's prohibitively high. It's very difficult to build an industry, to build um, um, a very well-run and profitable economy on the back of these high power costs driven by diesel generators. Um, and we provide savings for our clients, um, be it in Ghana, by just having solar power plants or night in Nigeria by having really these integrated power solutions, which through battery and solar technology um, reduce the dependency on the diesel generator and then um, subsequently also reduce power costs quite significantly. Um, typically by 20 to 30 percent reduction in power costs is, is possible, always depending a bit on what the baseline is, where's the client coming from. Um, 
but that's really what we're all about. Now, if we go to the next slide, um, I would like to talk a bit about how this now relates to the German desk um, and Africa Connect, which is the reason we are here today. Um, and I would just like to say, Daystar has been working with the German desk since its inception, really. Um, so I still remember uh, when the German desk was open, when Sebastian came um, to Nigeria. And um, from the very start, we have been engaged with this German desk because we thought it was a great idea and continue to think it's a great idea. And it's our main banking channel for all our banking needs, to be honest. So whether it's transactional banking and payroll, it's hedging through OTX futures or import financing, um, Axis Bank and the German Desk are really our go-to bank for these purposes. And that's, um, yeah, I think, really driven by what the German Desk is supposed to be. It really is um, a great gateway into um, very professional um, regional banking through Axis Bank, which uh, very luckily for us is in both Ghana and Nigeria, two of our, of our biggest markets, but also has this link then to European investors, European banks, and and can really be that bridge, and that's extremely helpful for us. And we continue continue to be a fan and a and a loyal customer. And um, with Africa Connect, I mean, I'm we've had a long journey with DEG, um, starting already back in 2017 with the upscaling program, which is kind of the uh, the one for smaller companies, and. Um, that was extremely helpful. The DG then um, placed an enormous amount of trust in us and our ability to uh, to scale and grow this business. And then um, together with um, yeah, the guidance really and the help of Mr. Helspers and his colleague, Mr. Klein from DG, um, we also now um, this year closed an Africa Connect financing line um, for the investment in solar power systems in Ghana specifically. And um, as was already mentioned before, um, the, by Mr. Schwab, um, the, the Africa Connect facility is really very helpful and very useful. It's, um, it's uncomplicated indeed. Um, it's quite attractive. Um, and for us, um, an extremely useful tool to um, really expand our business, in this case in Ghana, and invest in solar power assets which we can deploy at our customers. Um, and um, so we're yeah, very happy to do this. Um, I actually had a discussion with the Africa Connect team today, just as um, earlier today, and um, it's, it's been a great cooperation. You can go to the next slide, please. Um, here, I just want to share a bit of, um, you know, what the money from Africa Connect then goes into. So um, this is um, on the top, Right hand side, we see our solar power system at a steel plant in Ghana, it's a steel recycling plant actually, um, trying to reduce the need for steel imports for the construction industry, um, where we have built a very large solar plant of about one megawatt um, to, to reduce their power costs. Um, then below on the, on the bottom right, this is a solar power plant we have built this year um, at a bottling plant in Maiduguri. So in the very north of Nigeria, um, and um, which is also going going fantastically and helping there in, in an area which really relies almost entirely on diesel um, to reduce the power cost. Um, and lastly, um, just to share as well what um, Africa Connect um, and the DG is also always supporting when it supports us is really a very strong agenda for um, female empowerment and um, um, yeah, providing more space and access for female graduate engineers um, in, in this sector, which is really um, underrepresented. So women are heavily underrepresented in, so, in solar power. Um, and therefore, we have built a, a trainee program specifically for women engineers um, to um, yeah, work at Daystar Power and really um, go into a career here um and, and become very successful um and so if we go to the next slide um this then shows our our team in nigeria um still a few too many men but we're working on it um and um, yeah we, we hope to expand and grow it further um we're very thankful and grateful for the support of dg and the german desk it's been a fantastic um 
yeah, two years now, I think was said, um, and we're sure it's going to be many, many years more. Um, yeah, I'm very happy to do this journey together with you. Thank you very much, Graf von Hardenberg, Group Chief Executive Officer of Daystar Power, for this um, also very encouraging presentation. And this is it in terms of our presentations and inputs uh, for today. Um, you might have seen in your program that we're actually at the end of our um, time that was planned. Um, we do want to take at least uh, one question. I have received uh, one question, but I also want to mention again that it's possible to ask questions in the chat box. Um, so if you just want to type in your question either to the whole panel of all speakers or to one person specifically, please uh, do so. Uh, we can also actually plug you in to the conversation directly uh, with sound. I just want to mention at this point that uh, by doing so, you declare your consent uh, to be recorded, as this is a recorded session. Um, so please be aware of that. But um, I want to at least take uh, the one question that has already um, arrived in in uh, in my chat box here. and. Um, it reads, uh, Ms. Monica Beck has mentioned uh, the DEG regional office in Lagos. What regions are you overlooking from there? And in what countries do you currently see the best business opportunities? And I'm just thinking um, that question could possibly be best answered by Bernd Thielemann. I've seen you're part of the participants list. Um, so Bernd, if you hear us and if you can turn on your mic. Is that possible, Sarah? That, that we take Ben Thielemann into the conversation. Then probably uh, Ben Thielemann, head of the regional office of DG in Lagos, can speak to us on that question. I do have to stop sharing the slides then. Is that okay? Uh, yes, I think we can we can stop with the with the slides then. Yeah. All right. So while we're waiting um, to bring in Bernd Thielemann, um, let me again say you have the chat box to the right of your screens and uh, you can type in questions um, or let us know if you wanna be plugged into the conversation here. And is it possible to bring in Bernd? Not me, I can start. Yeah, um, that's a great idea. <laughs> and maybe I start. So the, the office in Lagos is our regional office for West Africa. We have two satellites, uh, one in Ghana and uh, one in Cote d'Ivoire. Um, and yeah, we are covering basically West Africa, where we see the biggest perspectives that could Bernd Thielemann answer in a much, much better way. But there's a question whether in the short run or in the medium run. I think in the medium run, uh, it's clearly in Nigeria. Uh, it will be soon among the, the five biggest countries worldwide. Um, yeah, only because of its uh, manpower, GDP growth. Um, uh, I think it's besides South Africa, Mauritius, uh, Botswana is uh, the most relevant um, economy in Africa, Egypt maybe also. So um, this is clearly uh, the country with the biggest potential. Uh, also with regard to the preparation of its uh, people, very good skills, uh, in principle very good preconditions. And that's also the reason why we have moved last year our regional office from Ghana to Nigeria, because we believe in, in Nigeria. But maybe Bernd, yes. you can add some more words. Now you are with us. Yeah, he should be able to talk. Oh, always. <laughs> yes, I can talk. Thank you. Always great if my boss takes the word. Thank you, Monica. <laughs> now, let me briefly explain. Yes. And we, 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 we moved the office from Ghana to Nigeria due to, let's say, call it market opportunities. We can't do things in, in, in West Africa, 
you know, without Nigeria, although we have been had a Nigerian presence for, I think, up to 40 years in terms of investment, but we thought that being right in this economy would give us the best visibility and mileage in, in terms of business. Um, and I think it has proven to be so. Generally, let me just briefly highlight that the, the regional office is for West Africa. Yes, we have also another office in Abidjan to cater for the francophone markets. You will know that in West Africa, we're talking about basically two separate worlds, including the investment streams when we talk about Anglophone and Francophone Africa. So it's very important for us to be also present in the Francophone Africa. Um, the main markets um, naturally where we are active are of course Nigeria and Ghana and in Francophone Africa here in West Africa, it's uh, Ivory Coast and Senegal. This is also where we have larger portfolios with our, let's call it, core business in DEG that, you know, addresses the larger funding tickets between 10 and 30 million in debt and equity. Um, overall, in those countries, we are most visible and we get most requests. I'm very happy about the, the, the testimonials that came from uh, Graf Hardenberg and um, Hendrik Reimers to also emphasize that we are more than money as such. Yeah? We try to really integrate our products, which means that this, uh, my work in the regional office is not confined to the standard DG business, but also it, it's about integrating the various products we have from working with German desks, um, catering for clients that are interested in Africa Connect, upscaling, and then leading to the larger or other funding services we offer. So we integrate by the product and we also have a big interest in doing regional integration. Um, always happy to see Africans investing in other African countries. Um, of course, uh, German Europeans, we have products for, we try to cover regions and, and products. And um, happy to also always provide our networks, which we have uh, again across the product range and country range and I'm happy to be at the service across the region. That's what we do from our office and with the team we have in Lagos. Thank you. Thank you so much, Monika Beck and uh, Bernd Thielemann for answering that question. Uh, we want to take one more question. Actually, we are already over time and we do also want to respect uh, your schedules. Uh, so we don't want to push it too long, but I think um, it is maybe a uh, good message if we give the last uh, word of this uh, whole session to our German desk manager, Sebastian. And you don't need to answer uh, the full question in every detail because I'm actually just mentioning this question because it is a typical question, I would say, uh, uh, between an opportunity and uh, you as a as a German desk manager and the German desk as an instrument. Uh, Francis asks, under what condition can a greenfield project with bankable business proposal and a formidable go-to-market strategy be supported with uh, funding? So uh, maybe let's um, abstract a little bit from the, from the direct example here. And I wanna give the last word uh, uh, to you, Sebastian. And as I said, uh, these are exactly the questions I think um, uh, that uh, the, the German desk is for, for answering. So if you could speak to that um, to, to end this session, I would hand over to you, Sebastian. Uh, thank you, thank you, Matthias. And, and I'm glad that you didn't mention that the question was specifically to brewery industry and that I should answer this question in specific why. Um, um, so, and Francis uh, from GEA, thank you. Thank you very much for the question. As uh, we have been engaging quite recently, also on your on your business, and which is also growing for the West African market. So, Francis, thank you for for taking your time as well. Um, I think greenfield projects uh, in times of COVID are are of course under a special radar, and um, not only the banks but also the regulators uh, try to uh, find stimuluses um, in regards to agriculture and to to. Uh, uh, sustainable businesses. So um, here again, and this is where I think the phone comes into into place of my presentation is um, we need to we need to listen carefully what kind of uh, industry exactly you want to in. And if you say brewery, I think we have a, a value chain behind that industry which we want to look into. 
uh, as Access Bank and the local bank, um, we have similar uh, approaches than we have in Germany. But the, the, the key point is that we need to look into the whole value chain and to see how we can support across this uh, before we say we just finance a greenfield project. Um, it's, it's, of course, not something we, we look into and we immediately would say that that's, that's the area we want to invest in, but it is something that we, we need to discuss on, on, on based on, on value chain. So, um, best thing to do is, uh, for instance, if we take a conversation offline as well and then take a look into, into the project within. But overall, yes, if, if, the, if the business is bankable, as you mentioned, um, Access Bank and the German desk is very much willing to do so. Thank you, Sebastian, for your answer here. And indeed, we're coming to a close uh, with this uh, third roundtable uh, on the German desk financial support and solutions. Nigeria, let me take a last round of uh, giving thanks to uh, the partners to the German desk, um, Cave WDEG the Access Bank uh, in Nigeria, and also AHK in Nigeria. Thank you to all speakers of today's uh, session, Dr. Stefan Traumann, uh, Roosevelt Obona, Monika Beck, Otimi Peters, Sebastian Barroso da Fonseca, Volker Schwab, um, uh, Jasper Graf von Hardenberg and Henrik Reimers. Thank you to all of you for taking the time to uh, join us today and for sharing your insights. Uh, usually, as we know, Access Bank, a nice reception would now follow uh, with uh, some time for uh, personal interaction. Uh, so uh, let's try and uh, do the best in our individual settings, um, however you want to structure that uh, uh, while you're leaving then your screen. But thanks for being with us almost uh, for two hours. Uh, stay with us, I can say at this point, uh, stay with the German desk, uh, stay in that kind of uh, network and partnership. And uh, thanks again to everybody. Until next time. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you very much, Monica. Thank, Thank you, Matthias. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.